Section forty nine of the Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Geeson. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section forty nine to sir watkin phillips baronet of jesus college oxford dear knight the manner of living at harrogate was so agreeable to my disposition that i left the place with some regret our aunt tabby would probably have made some objection to our departing so soon had not an accident embroiled her with mr mickle Whimmen, the scotch advocate on whose heart she had been practising from the second day after our arrival that original though seemingly precluded from the use of his limbs had turned his genius to good account in short by dint of groaning and whining he had excited the compassion of the company so effectually that an old lady who occupied the very best apartment in the house gave it up for his case and convenience when his man led him into the long room all the females were immediately in commotion one set an elbow chair another shook up the cushion a third brought a stool and a fourth a pillow for the accommodation of his feet two ladies of whom tabby was always one supported him into the dining-room and placed him properly at the table and his taste was indulged with a succession of delicacies culled by their fair hands all this attention he repaid with a profusion of compliments and benedictions which were not the less agreeable for being delivered in the scottish dialect as for mistress tabitha his respects were particularly addressed to her and he did not fail to mingle them with religious reflections touching free grace knowing her bias to methodism which he also professed upon a calvinistical model for my part i could not help thinking this lawyer was not such an invalid as he pretended to be I observed he ate very heartily three times a day, and though his bottle was marked stomachic tincture, he had recourse to it so often, and seemed to swallow it with such peculiar relish, that I suspected it was not compounded in the apothecary's shop or the chemist's laboratory. One day, while he was earnest in discourse with Mistress Tabitha, and his servant had gone out on some occasion or other i dexterously exchanged the labels and situation of his bottle and mine and having tasted his tincture found it was excellent claret i forthwith handed it about me to some of my neighbours and it was quite emptied before mr mickle Whimmen had occasion to repeat his draught at length turning about he took hold of my bottle instead of his own and filling a large glass drank to the health of mistress tabitha it had scarce touched his lips when he perceived the change which had been put upon him and was at first a little out of countenance he seemed to retire within himself in order to deliberate and in half a minute his resolution was taken addressing himself to our quarter i give the gentleman credit for his wit said he it was a good practical joke but sometimes he yoki in seria ducunt mala i hope for his own sake he hasna drank all the liquor for it was a very poorful infusion of jalap in bordeaux wine at it's possible he may attain sick a dose as will produce a terrible catastrophe in his own bulls by far the greater part of the contents had fallen to the share of a young clothier from leeds 
who had come to make a figure at Harrogate, and was in effect a great coxcomb in his way. It was with a view to laugh at his fellow guests, as well as to mortify the lawyer that he had emptied the bottle when it came to his turn, and he had laughed accordingly. But now his mirth gave way to his apprehension. He began to spit, to make wry faces, and writhe himself into various contortions. "'Damn the stuff!' cried he. "'I thought it had a villainous twang. Pah! He that would cousin a Scot mun get up betimes, and take old Scratch for his counsellor. "'In troth, Mester, what you call replied the lawyer. "'Your wit has run you into a filthy puddle. I'm truly concerned for your wayful case.' The best advice I can give you, in sick a dilemma, is to send an express to Ripon for Dr. War, without delay, and in the meantime, swallow all the oil and butter you can find in the house to defend your poor stomach and intestines from the vilication of the particles of the jallop, which is very violent, even when taken in moderation. The poor clothier's torments had already begun. He retired roaring with pain to his own chamber. The oil was swallowed, and the doctor sent for, but before he arrived the miserable patient had made such discharges upwards and downwards that nothing remained to give him further offence and this double evacuation was produced by imagination alone for what he had drank was genuine wine of bordeaux which the lawyer had brought from scotland for his own private use the clothier finding the joke turn out so expensive and disagreeable quitted the house next morning leaving the triumph to mickle women who enjoyed it internally without any outward signs of exultation on the contrary he affected to pity the young man for what he had suffered, and acquired fresh credit from this show of moderation. It was about the middle of the night which succeeded this adventure, that the vent of the kitchen chimney being foul, the soot took fire, and the alarm was given in a dreadful manner. Everybody leapt naked out of bed and in a minute the whole house was filled with cries and confusion. There was two stairs in the house, and to these we naturally ran, but they were both so blocked up by the people pressing upon one another that it seemed impossible to pass without throwing down and trampling upon the women. In the midst of this anarchy, Mr. Micklewhimmen, with a leathern portmanteau on his back, came running as nimble as a buck along the passage, and Tabby, in her under-petticoat, endeavouring to hook him under the arm that she might escape through his protection, he very fairly pushed her down, crying, "'Na, na, good faith! Charity begins at home!' Without paying the least respect to the shrieks and entreaties of his female friends, he charged through the midst of the crowd overturning everything that opposed him, and actually fought his way to the bottom of the staircase. By this time Clinker had found a ladder by which he entered the window of my uncle's chamber, where our family was assembled, and proposed that we should make our exit successively by that conveyance. The squire exhorted his sister to begin the descent, but before she could resolve, her woman, Mistress Winifred Jenkins, in a transport of terror, threw herself out at the window upon the ladder, while Humphrey dropped upon the ground that he might receive her in her descent. This maiden was just as she had started out of bed. The moon shone very bright, and a fresh breeze of wind blowing, none of Mistress Winifred's beauties could possibly escape the view of the fortunate clinker, whose heart was not able to withstand the united force of so many charms, 
at least i am much mistaken if he has not been her humble slave from that moment he received her in his arms and giving her his coat to protect her from the weather ascended again with admirable dexterity at that instant the landlord of the house called out with an audible voice that the fire was extinguished and the ladies had nothing further to fear this was a welcome note to the audience and produced an immediate effect the shrieking ceased and a confused sound of expostulation ensued i conducted mistress tabitha and my sister to their own chamber where liddy fainted away but was soon brought to herself then i went to offer my services to the other ladies who might want assistance they were all scudding through the passage to their several apartments and as the thoroughfare was lighted by two lamps i had a pretty good observation of them in their transit but as most of them were naked to the smock and all their heads shrouded in huge nightcaps i could not distinguish one face from another though i recognized some of their voices these were generally plaintive some wept some scolded and some prayed i lifted up one poor old gentlewoman who had been overturned and sore bruised by a multitude of feet and this was also the case with the lame person from northumberland whom mickle women had in his passage overthrown though not with impunity for the cripple in falling gave him such a good pelt on the head with his crutch that the blood followed as for this lawyer he waited below till the hurly-burly was over and then stole softly to his own chamber from whence he did not venture to make a second sally till eleven in the forenoon when he was led into the public room by his own servant and another assistant groaning most woefully with a bloody napkin round his head but things were greatly altered the selfish brutality of his behaviour on the stairs had steeled their hearts against all his arts and address not a soul offered to accommodate him with a chair cushion or footstool so that he was obliged to sit down on a hard bench in that position he looked around with a rueful aspect and bowing very low said in a whining tone your most humble servant ladies fire is a dreadful calamity fire purifies gold and it tries friendship cried mistress tabitha bridling yea madam replied mickle women and it trieth discretion also if discretion consists in forsaking a friend in adversity you are eminently possessed of that virtue resumed our aunt now madam rejoined the advocate well i wot i cannot claim any merit from the mode of my retreat you'll please to observe ladies there are two independent principles that actuate our nature one is instinct which we have in common with the brute creation and the other is reason no in certain great emergencies when the faculty of reason is suspended instinct takes the lead and when this predominates having no affinity with reason it pays no sort of regard to its connections it only operates for the preservation of the individual and that by the most expeditious and effectual means therefore begging your pardon ladies i'm no accountable in foro conscientiae for what i did while under the influence of this irresistible poor here my uncle interposing i should be glad to know said he whether it was instinct that prompted you to retreat with bag and baggage for i think you had a portmanteau on your shoulder the lawyer answered without hesitation if i might tell you my mind freely 
without incurring the suspicion of presumption i should think it was something superior to either reason or instinct which suggested that measure and this on a trois-fold account in the first place the portmanteau contained the writings of a worthy nobleman's estate and their being burnt would have occasioned a loss that could not be repaired secondly my good angel seems to have laid the portmanteau on my shoulders by way of defence to sustain the violence of a most inhuman blow from the crutch of a reverend clergyman which even in spite of that medium hath wounded me sorely even unto the pericranium by your own doctrine cried the parson who chanced to be present i am not accountable for the blow which was the effect of instinct i crave your pardon reverend sir said the other instinct never acts but for the preservation of the individual but your preservation was out of the case you had already received the damage and therefore the blow must be imputed to revenge which is a sinful passion that ill becomes any christian especially a protestant divine and let me tell ye most reverend doctor in a had a mind to plea the law would hold my libel relevant why the damage is pretty equal on both sides cried the parson your head is broke and my crutch is snapped in the middle now if you will repair the one i will be at the expense of curing the other this sally raised the laugh against mickle women who began to look grave when my uncle in order to change the discourse observed that instinct had been very kind to him in another respect for it had restored to him the use of his limbs which in his exit he had moved with surprising agility he replied that it was the nature of fear to brace up the nerves and mentioned some surprising feats of strength and activity performed by persons under the impulse of terror but he complained that in his own particular the effects had ceased when the cause was taken away the squire said he would lay a tea-drinking on his head that he should dance a scotch measure without making a full step and the advocate grinning called for the piper a fiddler being at hand this original started up with his bloody napkin over his black tie periwig and acquitted himself in such a manner as excited the mirth of the whole company but he could not regain the good graces of mistress tabby who did not understand the principle of instinct and the lawyer did not think it worth his while to proceed to further demonstration from harrogate we came hither by the way of york and here we shall tarry some days as my uncle and tabitha are both resolved to make use of the waters scarborough though a paltry town is romantic from its situation along a cliff that overhangs the sea the harbour is formed by a small elbow of land that runs out as a natural mole directly opposite to the town and on that side is the castle which stands very high of considerable extent and before the invention of gunpowder was counted impregnable at the other end of scarborough are two public rooms for the use of the company who resort to this place in the summer to drink the waters and bathe in the sea and the diversions are pretty much on the same footing here as at bath the spa is a little way beyond the town on this side under a cliff within a few paces of the sea and thither the drinkers go every morning in dishabille but the descent is by a great number of steps which invalids find very inconvenient betwixt the well and the harbour the bathing machines are ranged along the beach with all their proper utensils and attendants 
you have never seen one of these machines image to yourself a small snug wooden chamber fixed upon a wheel carriage having a door at each end and on each side a little window above a bench below the bather ascending into this apartment by wooden steps shuts himself in and begins to undress while the attendant yokes a horse to the end next the sea and draws the carriage forwards till the surface of the water is on a level with the floor of the dressing-room then he moves and fixes the horse to the other end the person within being stripped opens the door to the seaward where he finds the guide ready and plunges headlong into the water after having bathed he reascends into the apartment by the steps which had been shifted for that purpose and puts on his clothes at his leisure while the carriage is drawn back again upon the dry land so that he has nothing further to do but to open the door and come down as he went up should he be so weak or ill as to require a servant to put off and on his clothes there is room enough in the apartment for half a dozen people the guides who attend the ladies in the water are of their own sex and they and the female bathers have a dress of flannel for the sea nay they are provided with other conveniences for the support of decorum a certain number of the machines are fitted with tilts that project from the seaward ends of them so as to screen the bathers from the view of all persons whatsoever the beach is admirably adapted for this practice the descent being gently gradual and the sand soft as velvet but then the machines can be used only at a certain time of the tide which varies every day so that sometimes the bathers are obliged to rise very early in the morning for my part i love swimming as an exercise and can enjoy it at all times of the tide without the formality of an apparatus you and i have often plunged together into the isis but the sea is a much more noble bath for health as well as pleasure you cannot conceive what a flow of spirits it gives and how it braces every sinew of the human frame were i to enumerate half the diseases which are every day cured by sea bathing you might justly say you had received a treatise instead of a letter from your affectionate friend and servant j melford scarborough july first End of section 49